from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., Cole on Congress. The program discussing national issues that affect Oklahoma. Your host, U.S. Representative Tom Cole. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Cole on Congress. Today's guest from the 9th District of North Carolina is Congresswoman Sue Myrie. Sue served in the House of Representatives for eight terms and is currently on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, we're going to start today by discussing a variety of economic issues such as increased government spending, our need to audit the Federal Reserve, and the defrauding of taxpayers by ACORN. So let's get started. But before we do, I, I have to add just for our audience, Sue is just one of my favorite people in Congress. She yeah. came here with a really revolutionary class that balanced the budget for the first time in, uh, gosh, 40 or 50 years uh, and really got the country moving in the right direction. And, you know, some people are critical that we sort of lost our way a little bit, and we did. But you're one of those people who never have. And uh, well, thank I, you. It's absolutely true. When I arrived, you were the uh, uh, chairman of the Republican Study Committee, which for our listeners is, mm -hmm. I think, the uh, the center of fiscal sanity in the House is amongst uh, those people. And uh, you uh, persuaded me to join that group, which is something I've always been grateful for. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I always get to say when I go home, look, I always vote for the lowest budget possible, <laughs> which is the Republican Study Committee budget. And you made sure I voted for it the first time. So thank you very, very much. Well, you're welcome, but I don't think I needed to much convince you. Well, <laughs> but, uh, I think my mother would have come up here and got me if I hadn't voted the right way. Correct. But, but we also get to serve together on the Republican whip team, and uh, that gives me the opportunity to just hear your insights on the House. And for, again, our listeners, uh, Sue was a mayor and has an amazing mm -hmm. grasp of issues and, and is politically pragmatic while being a principled conservative. And that's a, a nice combination, one Thank we you. need around here. I appreciate your compliment. I really do. Well, you've seen, again, extraordinary things. Let's start off oh. with what you've seen this year, and then I just want to get your opinion. You know, we began this year, obviously, with this amazing stimulus bill, $787 billion, all of it borrowed, over a trillion, thousand-page bill. Then we had to race on to the omnibus spending bill and, and rewrite the 2009 budget and That's add right. uh, tens of billions of dollars of more spending. Then we passed, uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, 2000, not with our votes, obviously, passed a 2010 budget that envisions a $1.3 trillion deficit. Have you ever seen anything like this? Did you ever think you would see anything like this? No, I didn't. And the thing that's so disturbing is literally it's moving at lightning speed. You know, we somebody said the other day that we, in this short period of time, have spent more money than several previous administrations had spent, that we've done it all at one time. And we're borrowing 46 cents of every dollar the United States government is spending. Hey, I mean, people at home can't do that. You and I in a business couldn't do that. And the government can't sustain that rate. And, and just, I think it was today I saw where the stimulus that you mentioned, uh, there's like 2.8 million going to forest fires in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I mean, like forest fires here? Come on. You know, that's the type of thing that drives all of us crazy. And, it, and the people at home, I know in Oklahoma and in North Carolina, as well as around the rest of the country, can't believe it. I mean, I hear it every day. I'm fearful. I'm afraid for my country. Where's America going? Yeah. Do, uh, well, what do you see happening? Have you seen any uh, sort of sobering up on the other side in terms of slowing the spending down or beginning to un understand in the out years? Uh, the budget deficits we're talking about literally are going to break the bank, going to put us deeply in debt, and probably going to, to launch us into hyperinflation of some sort. Well, unfortunately, I don't think that um, the leadership is on the other side is listening to even their budget chairman, uh, who has always been a deficit hawk, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, I, just well, I find don't there were a lot it. more deficit hawks in the, in the, on the Democratic side in the Bush years than there are yeah. today. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've never met people that uh, condemned uh, the president for spending so much, and yeah. now he looks like a piker compared to what we're doing today. No, it's very true. Um, I, I think that after the August um, time we were home, you know, where most of us did hunt town halls and heard from our constituents, the people... Uh, are up here, some of them who are in conservative districts are starting to pay more attention 
because they got an earful when they went home. Tell me a little bit, I hadn't meant to ask you about this, but I'm gonna because mine were, I've never, you've, you've had longer service than mine, but I've never seen town hall meetings like I saw. How did these compare with what you've seen over your tenure in terms of the number of uh, people participating, yeah. the mood, the... Tom, you used to get, you know, if you got 200 people, it would be great. You usually get 30 to 40, and they would be the same people who would follow you <laughs> through the district from town hall to town hall, so it didn't accomplish anything. That's why we do tele-town halls. But literally, we had, the first one we had, we had uh, over 2,000 people. They had to turn them away because there was no parking. And it was phenomenal, and it was people on b both sides of the issue, but really and truly, People, the, it was not as much about health care as it was what you talked about, the stimulus, the spending, the um, take over the auto industry, uh, all of the things that have been going on that people are saying, hey, wait a minute. And it was like cabin and trade, of course. And then this was the straw that broke the camel's back, health care. And so thank goodness it's of the people, by the people, for the people. Remember that old mm -hmm. saying, our government's founded on it? They're starting to pay attention again, and that's what excites me. For the first time, I have hope that the American people are going to start doing what they need to do, and that is speaking out. Yeah, I uh, literally had somebody ask me, well, gosh, and of course they saw things on television that seemed raucous or rude. We didn't have that at we ours. I mean, either. you know, people were passionate, but they were polite and they were respectful. Uh, and, uh, you know, couldn't add, somebody asked me, a reporter said, what's it like? And I said, well, you know, I used to be a college professor, and it's like all the students love the subject, have read the homework, have showed up to class, have a lot of great questions, and man, do they want to debate. I mean, it was the most <laughs> wonderful thing ever. It's it a actually gave analogy. me very, it did. It gave me <laughs> wonderful hope for our country that, you know, when people get concerned, our government is responsive and, right. and will respond to public opinion. Yeah, and, and, and that's been part of the problem. Everybody's been kind of sitting back. You know, you hate to say that the old phrase, the monkey's on your back to do something, but it is because if, if members of Congress don't hear from people at home, they think everything's fine, and then they'll just do as they please. You and I don't do that, but I mean, a lot of them up here do. That's why we're seeing what's going on now. I'd like to talk to you about an issue that I know you're very knowledgeable about because you sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And probably in my state, uh, you know, health care may have been uh, where everything exploded, but cap and trade is a oh. huge issue in a state like Oklahoma, which sure. is an oil and gas and energy intensive state. Uh, so tell us a little bit about cap and trade, what it does, and what you saw uh, during the committee, your, your concerns about it. Well, we didn't have a whole lot of say so during committee, uh, to be honest with you. But um, cap and trade, I have great concerns over, on the overall issue. Now, first of all, I believe we need to do alternative energy. Um, all, the re all the sources you talk about um, are important to me. I mean, the things that we need to do to be environmentally conscious, I have no trouble with any of that. But when you talk about the way the House wrote the cap and trade bill, it literally is a way to reduce emissions. And you know, there's nothing wrong with reducing emissions, but there are a couple problems here. One, when you look at the world market, when you have China and India saying we aren't going to participate in any of this and they're two of the largest polluters in the world, we could do everything in the world here in the United States and still not make a dent. But the biggest concern I have is, number one, the taxes that were in the bill. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars. And that falls on the back of, of you and me as consumers in our electric bills or gas bills. But business and industry, the, the restrictions they put on business and industry to actually do this very quickly, in effect, um, are very concerning to me because you know, they're penalized if they don't. And there's only, you can only move so fast if you're making major capital changes in your equipment or in your plants or building new plants or whatever it may be. You can't just do that overnight. And, and I feel that the deadlines are just unreasonable. And so uh, I was very glad when the Senate said that, first of all, they weren't going to do it. Now, who knows what they're going to do? But um, everybody said the issue's off the table for a while. So I hope, again, the American people will let their voice be heard. Because, well, nuclear, for instance. I know you're heavy gas and oil, which I support, and drilling off the coast and all that. But literally, nuclear was not a part of the bill. We couldn't yeah. have a discussion on nuclear. Now, how can you talk about emissions-free energy without nuclear? Give me a break. Yeah, that, uh, you know, France gets 80% of their electricity from, that we get 20% of ours. And we're, Japan. We're, yeah, 
it's uh, it was absolutely insane not to include that if you're really serious, if it's really right. an environmental bill. And that's the key. Are you really serious about doing the right thing? You know, again, I take this back to national security because we are too dependent on all those countries that don't like us, literally, and are working against us every day, not only in their own countries, but up in the UN. And here we are, you know, spending, what is it, $700 billion a year uh, buying oil from other countries. Though That could be producing jobs. I don't have to tell you that. I mean, your state produces those jobs. We do. And, uh, you know, again, we're, we're like you. We, we're big, uh, all kinds of energy. I mean, we're a big wind power state. Mm -hmm. We believe in biomass. We're not uh, very big in the uh, ethanol business, yeah. uh, in the corn-based <laughs> ethanol, but we believe in biomass. Well, that, that's kind of defeated itself. It, I it, mean, look at the food supply problem. It, it, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it, you know, everything from cattle feed to riots over tortillas in Mexico City. I mean, it's a, it's one of the dumbest things the federal government's ever done and distorted the food I chain. Agree. Really I terrible. Agree. Uh, somebody did ask me on cap and trade, though, was, could, Congressman, could you say anything good about it? I said, yes, I really can. It's the best uh, economic development bill China and India have ever had because there That's will true. be thousands of jobs in our country outsourced to those countries because they have a different energy regulatory pattern than we do. Well, why should somebody build a new plant here in the United States with all of the heavy regulation they have on them if they can go to another country and build it without any regulation, get cheaper labor? We're doing everything we can to disincentivize uh, our business and industry to stay here. And you know, we're in a jobless recovery, so we need to be creating jobs. And I'm really frightened about the fact that we've lost our manufacturing base and we aren't doing anything to bring that back. Now, do you think, as I did, I, I think that probably the House leadership was surprised that the vote was as close as it was. I mean, that was a pretty tenacious fight. Uh, over cap and trade. Uh, obviously, a lot of Democrats broke and joined with us, have the same kinds of concerns that you and I have expressed mm -hmm. here. And that actually gives me a lot of hope in the United States Senate, because if you look at the distribution of votes, uh, most of the, the members of the House that voted for cap and trade come from only 14 or 15 states with, you know, that would mean 28 senators. The majority of those who are opposed come from the other states where you have 72 senators. I, I'm talking with Jim Inhofe from our state, who's a leader on this issue in the United States Senate, and his judgment is they'll never be able to pass something like the House bill uh, through the United States Senate. He doesn't think, honestly, they'll be able to pass anything at all at this point. Well, it's interesting because you always amaze me with your knowledge of all of what happens politically across the country. <laughs> when you start saying, you know, you know all these statistics and you know exactly what happened when and what not, I mean, I admire you for that because <laughs> I don't pay any attention to that. <laughs> well, you just do the right thing every time. That's, uh, that's why you're such a superb representative. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, cap and trade, we'll see. Tell me, um, what do you think about, uh, frankly, where we're headed economically? Obviously, the, the economic challenges we've had have been used to justify a lot of the out-of-control spending or uh, what's, I think, one of the most misguided uh, energy bills of all time that will absolutely destroy, uh, you know, abundant right. and, and reasonably priced energy in this comp company. But uh, so where do you think the economy is going? Well, I'm really concerned about the fact of, um, as we talk about um, where, where we are headed, um, how do you have a jobless recovery, first of all? I mean, you know, in order to create a recovery, you have to have jobs. That's a concern. I'm very concerned about a lot of the policy that's being implemented and things that they're doing, like, for instance, um, you know, we have two of the largest banks in um, the country. Not only one of them is headquartered there, but the other has a large presence. And, uh, you know, when they try and pay their money back, they're getting pushback from the federal government about paying their money back so they can get out from under the government regulations. Um, that concerns me. I'm, I'm concerned about, even with when you talk about energy, this all ties in because, you know, as part of the cap and trade, they would set up that new um, derivatives market um, so you could trade 
carbon emissions. I mean, come on, you know, this is like, talk about something that, trading something that doesn't exist and looking at how we got in the problem we're in already. How does that help us? Oh, I think that's the most pernicious aspect of the bill. I mean, the, the, the carbon limitations, I think, are outrageous and unreasonable and based on science that, frankly, we don't know enough yet to, to be legislating at this, on this kind of scale. But the idea that we would create a market uh, in these energy credits uh, that would be on Wall Street, that would be, and people could participate in that, did, that neither produced nor consumed energy, but just uh, engage in a speculative enterprise. Uh, you know, the, the same guys that got us into the mess that we were in last September uh, would make millions or billions of dollars. And I guarantee you, the average taxpayer would be the person that would be stuck. It sure. would be the American consumer. Well, it, it scares me because when you, you look at the fragility still of our financial system, and it is fragile. I mean, we've had a lot of banks fail. There are a lot more that uh, they say are going to fail, uh, which is a very precarious situation. And then I look at the national security issue, and I tie these two together because even one of the, you know, the, just recently there have been um, at least four and a couple more that are under investigation, terrorist plots that have been foiled and haven't happened here in this country because we had good infiltration um, of agents in there and, um, you know, good communications and that type of thing. But when I look at that, the one guy who did the, was going to do the bombing in Dallas mm -hmm. picked an office building where there was a large bank um, presence. And he said he did it because he wanted to further harm our financial system. And so here we are sitting here, very vulnerable. And um, I'm extremely concerned at the policies of the administration, not just financially, but national security-wise, because it, we're at a time when we are, as I said, vulnerable in many areas, and we are having stepped up presence of cells from Al Qaeda, others, you know, there's, there's hundreds of them literally as far as different groups are concerned and all that. And, and we, we have an administration that seems to be lessening the things in our national security apparatus that would protect us. And I say that simply because of what's happening with the prosecution, uh, investigation and possible prosecution of CIA agents by the Attorney General, which has the President's support. Now that concerns me greatly because our CIA agents are the guys on the front line. I mean, they do the horrible jobs. I, I mean, they're patriots, that's why they do it. But we're saying to them, you go out and do this really dangerous job without any backup from us whatsoever, and we're going to prosecute you? Well, and we've also always traditionally had, uh, frankly, a situation where people respected what the previous administration had done, even if they disagreed with it. We didn't look back. Uh, and, of course, the president initially said a lot of good things about mm -hmm. that. And, of course, the CIA was looked at. There was a thoroughgoing investigation. Yes. And the conclusion by the Justice Department, and not by uh, political appointees, but by career professionals, was, you know, whatever's occurred here doesn't rise to the level of a prosecution. We ought to move forward. Right. Instead, you know, we're now looking back and, and doing it at a very, very dangerous time. Well, seven former CIA heads. Of Under the, both parties. Yeah both Republican and Democrat said, don't do this. Well, and frankly, to his credit, uh, every indication we have from the current CIA director, Leon Panetta, is that he argued, he did. don't do this. He, uh, did. You know, he certainly has uh, been uh, very forthright about wanting to be you know, uh, transparent to Congress, but also to maintain the ability of his agency to do its job. I know, and it just, it really is frightening to me because it's kind of like that's the tip of the iceberg, what's next? You know, and I know you agree and <laughs> understand because you're a great historian, but national security is our number one mission of this federal government. We're supposed to protect our citizens. And it's like, you just don't yeah. change policy as quickly as we are. I'm, I'm never uh, disappointed if we have a strong debate about civil liberties. I think that's a oh, very sure. important that's part. Oh, sure, that's a different story. You know, and that, that's, that's kind of who we are as a people, mm -hmm. and these things ought to be discussed and looked at. That tension's healthy. But, you know, we also ought to remember that, uh, you know, at the time of the Civil War, uh, Abraham Lincoln took some extraordinary steps as commander-in-chief because he thought 
they were necessary to preserve the Union. Congress did not come back into office and investigating. It came back and passed legislation, actually, that, that said anything done by the, you know, in this situation up to this point is, is sort of grandfather is okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were very vigorous in their oversight. But again, you could argue some of the actions taken to make sure that Maryland didn't succeed or uh, what have you were, were, they were certainly extraordinary, uh, extra constitutional, exactly if not right. unconstitutional. And there, there are moments in history where that, that happens. I, I often think uh, poor, uh, poor President Bush, uh, uh, you know, won't be appreciated uh, very much uh, unless people stop and think back to 912, if you'd have told me the day after 911, we would go to this point, thank goodness, and not have another uh, attack in the United States, that tells me that a lot of people have done a lot of good things. Our intelligence people have done a good job. Our border security people have done a better job than they get credit for, certainly in the terrorism. Our military people, by taking the war abroad That's rather than right. here, uh, have done a lot. I mean, they've spared the American people a great deal, and, and uh, undercutting them now is not the way to go forward. No, and, 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 it, and what is happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan is tied to this, because we went through and did a a little research on the fact of different FBI investigations on some of these recent plots that were foiled. And these guys literally had ties back to either training in Al-Qaeda camps or they had communications back there, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a definite link between the two. You can't deny that. No, you're out. Well, you'll remember, of course, uh, and I know our listeners will as well, the tremendous debates we had simply because the United States government uh, you know, was monitoring tele uh, telephone oh, conversations yes. overseas between non-American citizens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, you know, maybe Pakistan to uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. simply because they were routed through the United States. Uh, and uh, the idea that that was violating anybody's civil liberties uh, is just unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. Most Americans I know said, don't worry about that. Just make sure that we don't have another 9-11 here. Well, as somebody said, if you're not doing anything wrong, what do you have to worry about? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's absolutely true. Well, since we're sort of whipping ourselves into outrage, which is pretty easy to do, let's talk about the outrage of the day, which is ACORN. Oh. Uh, you know, the, the Association of Community Organizers. And, um, uh, you know, I first became acquainted with them uh, several years ago because of their political activity and uh, the registration of voters and how many cases were turning up where people were fraudulent. I mean, they just, they didn't exist. Uh, uh, things were being put in and uh, the ACORN defense was there's nothing wrong with putting people down that aren't real people unless they actually vote. So it was okay to get them registered. That oh, wasn't a no. violation. No, literally, I that hadn't was one heard of their that. That's right. They didn't. And since these people didn't really exist, they couldn't vote. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, had FBI well, that's investigation. That's a good one. Yeah, uh, but uh, we, you know, we got we got a few newspaper articles about it. But this latest scam is just unbelievable to me. Well, it's not, not not only what they're doing right now, but you know the fact is the guy that was the head of it embezzled over a million dollars, and his brother covered up for him. I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. The brother covered up for him, so nobody was supposed to know that. Uh, the good thing is the IRS has severed their relationship. The Census Bureau has. Treasury is investigating him. I think GAO is investigating. The FBI is looking at him. And it's unfortunate because, you know, you knew about this a long time ago. You and others were sending up red flags, and nothing was done. And it took something as dramatic as this incident of exposing them from the inside for people to start to say, oh my goodness, what's wrong? Even their corporate sponsors, I know Bank of America has said that they're pulling their sponsors. Well, you know, the thing is, obviously, it's outrageous in terms of, uh, of advising people how to set up, uh, you know, prostitution rings and evade uh, any kind of uh, taxation or federal oversight. But the thing that actually bothered me the most, I remember putting a statement out on this on Facebook, uh, was this is an agency supposed to look after the poor. Yeah. And, and, you know, what would you think if you were a struggling single mother with two kids working, trying to make it, probably in a tough neighborhood, and your friends down at Acorn decided that they would set up a brothel in your neighborhood? You know, the, what a, what a, what a betrayal of your basic mission. I mean, you know, what's that do? What, what kind of, how does that help the quality of life? What sort of, uh, you know, crime is associated with that? 
uh, it, it just was an unbelievable abuse of people that you were supposed to be helping, that you, you know, you, whose mantle you said you were championing. No, it's true. I just, um, you know, they need to get to the bottom of it, but the organization just needs to go out of business. Because, it really does. Um, you know, I, and, and it raises a, a deeper question about the funding of advocacy organizations in general by, by the government. Uh, you know, I'm very strong pro-life. I know you're very strong pro-life. Uh, I appreciate uh, the work that the uh, National Right to Life folks do. They don't take federal money. Right. You know, they're they're funded by contributions, and that's appropriate. Uh, I don't know why you know Planned Parenthood on their side, but these kind of, government has no business right. funding, uh, whether it's on the left or the right groups that, uh, that you know, frankly, are, are in the political advocacy business. That's okay. Let them go advocate, but let them do it on, on privately own. raised dollars. No, you're absolutely right. And I hope that message gets strong, you know, through <coughs> loud and strong to people at home because um, it's frightening. When you, when you start to look at how policy can be changed and using t people's tax dollars to do that, I mean, something's wrong with this picture, as you said. Yeah, it's bad. Let me ask you this. You, again, I'm going to draw on your perspective a little bit uh, as somebody who has seen, uh, you know, a lot of change in the House of Representatives, a number of years for the good, would argue maybe recently not, not so good. Uh, what's your view of the future? How optimistic are you uh, about uh, the country sort of uh, getting back on the right track and finding itself again? I'm very optimistic for the simple reason that what makes this country work is the American people. It's not the government, it's not Congress, it's not Washington. It's the guy on the street who goes out there and pours hot tower, a tar on, a, on an on office roof in the middle of August. He's committed <laughs> to doing that. It's, you know, our military guys who go overseas and protect us. It's the guy who starts a small business in the middle of a recession because he has confidence that he's got the ability to do it. If we would just stay out of the way as far as government is concerned and let the American people run their lives and run their business, and do the things that they know how to do, they're the ones that are responsible for this economy rebounding. And we need to do that. We need to allow the American people to use their ingenuity. Uh, I mean, that, that's, it, that's what it's all about. It's them, not us. Well, that's a, a message not often heard around here. It's one of the reasons <laughs> I like you so much. And, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. Uh, uh, I had served with a legislator once who told me, and she's one of the best legislators I ever met, and she said, you know, I always promised myself uh, that I would leave public service when I started saying things couldn't be done, that it was just politically impossible to do them, because that meant I just wasn't willing to do the hard lifting that it took to get good the point. things done. That's a very uh, good And point. you've never lost that zeal. I mean, you know, good times, bad times, you always, you know, show up and... Uh, full of fight and uh, you know state our positions well and it's uh, it's kind. noticed and appreciated thanks oh, i'm the least kind person that you know <laughs> <laughs> believe me uh, well if you uh, let me ask you a question i asked mm -hmm. another guest recently uh, and it's going to have to be quick but uh, the big fight of the day is health care mm -hmm. uh what's your bet uh, as to whether or not we get a bill out of the house uh, and out of Congress to the president's desk. Well, they might force a bill out of the House because they'll buy votes to get it. But very frankly, with the Senate the way it is, I don't see it happening. And it's not going to happen before next year as far as a bill getting to the president if there is one. If they do a bipartisan bill, then there's a shot. Well, I'll tell you what I told my last guest. Since you said that, if they don't make it out, I'll ask you back next uh, <laughs> next year to help us fix it. Congresswoman, we're just about out of time, but I, I want to thank you. I hope our listeners have enjoyed this show of coal on Congress. And the one thing I'm certain of is that they certainly understand why I like and admire you so much and appreciate the leadership you bring to the floor of the House every single day. Sue, thanks for coming and joining us today. Glad to be here.